Welcome back to the latest episode of the Flex Success Podcast, where we teach you how to be less shit. As always, we will be your co-hosts. I'm Lizzie, and this is Dean. Now, if you find value in this episode, be sure to give us a like, subscribe, and drop a comment below on YouTube. Share us with your friends. Give us a five-star rating on your favorite podcast app. And if you want to take a screenshot and tag us on Instagram, just do that by putting in at flex underscore success. And while you're on Instagram, you can check out everything we offer from our eBooks to courses and programs. You can book a consultation or inquire about coaching via the link in our bio, or you can do that on our website. Enjoy the episode. All right. We are back with flex coach George. Once again, we have invited George on the podcast a few times now because you're just, just an epic guest. So welcome. Thank you very much. I think I was crunching the numbers. Like if we're around 100 episodes and I've made like four to five appearances, I'm nearly like 120th of all your episodes. That's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. That is pretty cool. It might even put you in the 0.01% of guests. <laughs> I think it does. Like we were discussing on the other part. It certainly does. No one's been on four times. No, no, no one has. Um, now, today, George, we are going to talk about housing prices and, <laughs> and interest rates. This is what we were talking about before we pressed record. <laughs> Don't think you guys are here to listen to that. We actually, uh, as a team at Flex, are constantly doing something to do with upskilling, going through a course or a book or a study or something together as a group. And our most recent escapades were um, allowing one coach to present to the coaching team about any topic of their choice related to coaching, training, nutrition, recovery, habit change, anything like that. Um, Dean chose vaping, which is what we did in the previous episode. George chose to present on lengthened reps. And actually everyone's presentation were, I thought, quite shareable and awesome, which is why we've decided to record this episode with George today based off his presentation to the group. And George chose, what was it? Did I already mention? You did, lengthened did. reps. Lengthened reps. Or perhaps the considerations between whether or not you should bias or preference your training towards a lengthened rep versus a shortened rep, which George will explain. What on earth is a lengthened rep? Are we going to do any updates before we kick it off? Though? Are we going to do any up? All right, let's do some updates. Personal update, George. What's new? What do people need to know? I'm fat, I'm heavy, it's hard to get upstairs and I get out of breath very quickly. <laughs> but apart from that, that life was, is good. That was so efficient that it was almost like you prepared it. <laughs> so, so why are you fat, heavy and out of breath? I'm, I'm not that fat, I was only joking. Um, it's just off season, I'm kind of, I'm touching new territory again on my heaviest weight. Obviously I look fantastic in comparison to when I was last here, but it just seems to be a crossing point for me that when I go north of 110, that things do start to get very sluggish, even though I'm in better body comp. Like I think just the physical mass that I have is just harder for me to, to sustain and, and do right. normal things. It's getting hard to tie up the shoelaces again. I mean, last off season and my heaviest, I did actually have to wear sliders all the time or lift my leg up to Zoe to get her to do my shoes up. It was that quite is... <laughs> <laughs> That is hilarious. And you live on the top level too of your house. It's not exactly like, I mean, unless you, unless you live in a mansion with a, an elevator or something. Do you live in a mansion with an elevator, George? I wish. I okay. wish. Or I've do you there. perhaps hire a dwarf to carry you up on their back? <laughs> no. no Why a dwarf? I don't know. His legs would touch the ground if he was piggybacking on a dwarf. <laughs> I could try and like plank on his head, maybe. You're like six like, foot something, aren't you? Just uh, I'm just under six one. I can't claim six one yet. Yeah. He's not piggybacking on. I may have should have chosen a, a giant instead. I think you should have. I think mm. you should rethink all of your life choices, Dean. I will from I'll this pop moment it on today, okay. including whether or not I should train my biceps in a lengthened position or not. <gasps> yes. That is a life decision we all have to consider <laughs> because if you don't have big biceps, I mean, why even be alive? Um, look, I can't think of a counter argument to that. Yeah. Mm. That's it, must be true. Dean, <laughs> Dean makes a good point. <laughs> Big steps. <laughs> okay, well, with that personal update out of the way, <laughs> from a small person, by the way, um, and for all the other small listeners, um, the idea of purposefully putting on that much weight is so wild to me. Um, yeah. And so. getting to the point where you're like, I don't even want to eat food anymore. I'm, I'm not full. hungry anymore. It is a really weird place to be in, hey. Um, having yeah. spent the last 14 months, like, actively restraining myself from getting chubby, there's still the period where I'm like, oh, I would really like to just eat a lot of food today. But I remember when I was here, like, saying, like, north of 110 kilos, I was just like, oh, I could just not eat for three days. Everything is a chore over that weight. I remember like, hey, Dean, I'm going for a walk. He's like, no, I've got to eat. It's always, I've just eaten 
or no, I've got to eat. Like, mm. can you just stop spending your life eating, please? It's literally my response to Zoe every time she says you want to go do steps. Like, I've either got to make a meal, I've either just eaten a meal, I need to lay down for a good 10 minutes. <laughs> it's not good. It's really not good. Yeah. One thing I noticed is the difference. Like, I was performing a lot better when I was more body fat last off season. Mm-hmm. I think for me, my set point of optimal performance and strength and performance in training is actually a little bit further west than where I am now. So I'm actually a little bit excited to see if I can keep pushing and extending this out to get to that point again in a similar comp and see if I notice the same transaction and, and effect with my performance again. Because at last off season, there was not a single weight that moved. And even now, I'm, I'm kind of feeling a lot more fatigue and, strength, uh, and lack of strength at the moment. Interesting. Mm. I actually have a client that's fairly similar. We had that discussion around, like, you know, well, what is optimal in regards to the body fat that you sustain in an off season versus a prep and how far away from a prep weight should you be, et cetera. And I'm like, you just seem to be one of those guys that just needs to be okay with having to pull off 25 kilos instead of 15, because you suck at everything when you're 15, (laughs) you know, like he's hungry all the time. He's moody. It's like, he's in prep. And it's like, man, you just don't want to spend your entire year there and then prep. So some people are just like that. Yeah. But even like physiological markers, insulin sensitivity, blood pressure, all seem to be really good, even when mm. I was excessively a lot more fat. So we'll see. Mm. More pop tarts than needed. Mm. Can you do a body weight chin up at this weight? I actually did uh, two sets of 10 the other day. Oh, look at you go. I don't know why I, don't know why I just decided I, I would see if I could actually do a pull up and I was actually right. At it. And you did 10 of them twice. <laughs> yes. Good. With a 15 minute break, though, because you catch his breath. <laughs> <laughs> ten, reps is, <laughs> 10 reps is a lot of reps doesn't count doesn't count mm. um <laughs> all right george kick us off what on earth are lengthened reps so the concept of trying to optimize training in the last couple of decades has really been a big focal point as science has kind of evolved and we've started to understand how the body works a little bit better and there's been a big argument with like full range of motion and and whether or not it's the best method to create an adaptation in hypertrophic stimulus, right? It's a growing muscle. Uh, and when we think about training, we can train the muscle bellies at different lengths. So there's a, there's a length tension relationship where you can put stress on a, a muscle belly at different points, depending on perhaps exercise selection or form and execution, your setup, maybe on like a cable exercise or something. And what it just simply means is the point where most tension is being applied for stimulus at what point on the rep so if we think about bicep curl because we've been speaking about bicep curl the lengthened range when you're hitting the most stimulus there would be when your arm is fully extended and the shortened range would simply be when you're at maximal contraction the medial range that kind of midway point in between of the rep so what i was looking at for my topic of uh, to present to the group was is there a benefit to prioritizing a muscle length tra- so stimulus in a certain muscle length in comparison to others um, and it's something that we've toured over for quite a lot in, in the kind of evidence-based space of training for a while now that we lent on training the muscle in that length and position or applying more stimulus in that stretch or length and position to be slightly more beneficial um, and it was quite nice that the, the meta-analysis that i found uh, from greg knuckles and milo wolf took a good look at all the relevant up-to-date data in longer muscle length training and shorter muscle length training Uh, and as a summary for what they found as quickly they looked into the uh, changes in uh, muscle cross-sectional area the increases or change in muscle length the hypertrophy found in the proximal muscle region so the shortened muscle space so when we're at like maximal contraction the hypertrophy in the middle muscle regions and or the hypertrophy in the distal muscle region so when it's fully lengthened they're just fancy terminologies uh, to explain which part of that rep range you're in and what they found in the summary was uh, they put a nice lovely table up to kind of highlight what was more beneficial and they found that in all cases training at a longer muscle length was more beneficial for all of those variables that we just spoke about except for hypertrophy in the shortened range which seemed to be pretty balanced if you applied more stimulus and focus in the shortened range loading now from that study i thought there'd be two i found two good interesting studies to pull from uh, to reference and kind of solidify these points so in the first study they were looking at length and range loading in comparison to shorter range loading loading with exercise selection parameters being the the key differences there, Uh, specifically in the hamstring. So we had a seated ham curl in one group and a prone ham curl in the other. And the thing that kind of separates them for lengthen versus shorten is the angle of hip extension that you're in from the glute and the hip there. That creates a larger angle and a a larger length and tension change to the lengthen bias. And when we're in the prone uh, prone hamstring curl, we either flat on the machines or with a slight hip extension, but it does it changes the angle slightly so that you're not biasing that length and range of the hamstring so much. What they t- they took two really interesting. 
As I say, just quickly, just because I, I know terminology, prone would be laying hamstring curl for anyone listening that isn't viewing, uh, just because there's some hand gestures going on and people can't hear what we're showing. Can't see what you're saying. They yeah. can't hear what we're saying. I, I always <laughs> watch. Yes. I always watch podcasts on YouTube. I never listen to them, so I always forget that oh, people right, can't right. see what I'm doing. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, prone, prone means prone facing down. Laying, and then um, when you're talking about the seated, obviously the hips are flexed or like crunched. So you can kind of think that about would mean like knee to chest is hip chest, flexion. Yeah. yeah. And that's putting the, the hamstring in the most lengthened position because of the hip. So like when you, when you do a bar, for the listeners, when you do a barbell RDL, when you're at the bottom of the rep, you're in hip extension maximally. So the angle is at like more or less a really sharp angle there. And then if you're at the top of the rep, imagine that's like when you're laying down and signal again, oh. that is not in that range. Oh. Uh huh. Yeah. So the two interesting points that we took from this first study I looked at, uh, it gives us some considerations actually now for growth phase specific training and also fat loss specific training, which was really, really cool and interesting because up until now with old school bro science, it's always been that analogy, Dean, I'm sure you're aware of what built the muscle will keep the muscle. And that variable remains true on some parameters like progressive overload. Those variables will always stay consistent when we're trying to maintain tissue. We still need to send that signal of progressive overload through some variable to keep that adaptation signify that we need to keep the, the tissue there. But thinking about how we specifically program in either or phase, this highlighted it very, very well. So when they looked at the two studies, uh, sorry, the two cohorts, one doing the seated ham curl and one doing the laying ham curl, they found that the laying ham curl group saw large degrees of increases in muscle mass in comparison to the laying. But yeah, so they the put the same... Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, seated okay. in comparison to the laying. Oh. And then in the same two groups, they then put them into a calorie deficit and then track the same parameters for muscle maintenance or prevention of muscle loss. And what they found was there was actually no significant difference in the fat loss phase or in a deficit for the prevention of muscle tissue. So to prevent muscle loss, length and training, short and training, both apply pretty much the same kind of response. So in a growth phase, that leaves us with some considerations that potentially we might want to put more focus into length and range loading, whether that be through exercise selection, tempo manipulation, or intensifier or training methods to be applied and that in a fat uh, in the fat loss phase or the you know dieting start uh, phase of someone's physique development perhaps we might not want to put so much focus on that the reasons why we maybe want why, might not to it comes down to the potential risks of training at longer muscle lengths there is a, a in this same study they they drove uh, they drew from this that there was a larger degree of effective stimulus and larger metabolic stress in the length and range which is what was causing that adaptation but with this larger degree of stimulus and metabolic stress comes a larger cost of fatigue and you are more prone to injury in that position. So one of the natures that changes in a fat loss phase or on a prep for a competitive client is the suboptimal environment of recovery. So perhaps we don't want to take that risk of putting them into a potentially vulnerable position, training at more uh, uh, longer muscle lengths in comparison to the shorter muscle lengths when we know that in theory, both seem to drive a similar response in maintaining tissue. Mm. Mm. And this, this is, I think, was where the rubber, rubber hits the road in regards to taking a snippet from a study whereby people then don't think about the application. But this also applies into the, into the off-seasonal growth in that just because so far from what you're suggesting, there is a greater stimulus and hypertrophic response to lengthened biased training doesn't mean that we should only do lengthened biased training for the exact same reasons as you mentioned for fat loss, in that we have to consider like, how much fatigue is that accumulating? What is the relative risk profile uh, in regards to injury and whatnot too? So uh, I think people can sometimes snapshot that shit and forget about application pretty quickly. So that's a really cool point. I think that the, the level of training we're talking about as well will massively change your ability to apply certain programming techniques or, you know, you're not going to take someone who's just come to you who's never really trained and say, right, we're going to bias this seated ham curl with partials in the length and range because of X, Y, Z, but they've got not, not got the foundational skill to train safely or appropriately or good understanding of what full range of motion and execution does look like. So we're putting them at a larger risk to cause injuries to themselves without that foundation first. Mm. Obviously, when we start to get into like the more intermediate level of trainers, the more experienced guys, we can definitely manipulate that a lot more. But would you, I'll ask you a question there, Dean. So would you put length and range loading, at, say the start of a workout? Doesn't matter on the skill level of the individual. Well, this is the thing is that I suppose it depends on what your argument is for. Like if, if we were to take like, say, the greatest benefit, we could say, yes, like, let's bias it at the start. But then we could also say like maybe that load is too great if we're going to do something like that and we want to put it towards the end. So, again, this is where the rubber For injury the risk management. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Or even fatigue yeah. management, you know, like 
that I have some guys that are incredibly strong in an RDL, but like, do I need them to be maximally strong? Like, do I need them to lift the most absolute weight that they can? Biasing the length and range there, or can I maybe put them at the back end? But then does the back end also increase their risk profile because now fatigue setting? So these are just all questions, you know? Um, yeah, the problem. And it always has to be contextually, contextually applied to the individual. But I think something to say is like a safety precaution there. Most individuals, and I'm not saying you know some of the more experienced in, uh, intermediate trainees, probably don't appropriately warm up in respect to connective tissues, ligaments, tendons, and obviously their joint health. So potentially chucking in a seated ham curl as your first exercise where you've got more bias and length and range loading might not be applicable for the injury risk. So although it doesn't seem like it's a heavily costing, you know, taxing exercise, perhaps you might want to consider programming that a little bit later after an exercise where you've warmed up, you've allowed for a good blood flow, uh, to connective tissues are fully stretched, they become less, um, more viscous and less uh, rigid. So I think there's considerations there for exercise order and programming. And um, the second study I drew on, which I thought was quite interesting, was looking at partial reps performed on the hamstring in hip extension. Everything seems to be on the hamstring when we look at length and range loading, except for the new one that I spoke to you about earlier. Um, so they looked at the hamstring in hip extension and knee flexion. Uh, and in this, they concluded that the partial reps performed in the length and range produce more hypertrophic outcomes than the partial reps in the short. And now, obviously, to us, this seems like quite a, a clear, obvious reason you're spending more time in that length and range that we've just said is more beneficial for hypertrophic outcomes. But this, for people listening, is due to the large degree of tension and time under tension spent in the length and range there. So looking back to like the old school bodybuilders now, when they would get to, like I think, you know, the methodology was kind of going in the right direction but not quite foolproof where they'd get to the end of their sets and once the short and range was exhausted on say a bench press and they couldn't fully extend and lock out their arms anymore they would then pump out reps at the bottom part of that rep not really understanding what they were doing but just thinking yeah it's all good to push the failure yeah let's completely fry the cns we know that's probably not logical but they probably saw a good response from that anecdotally without understanding what they were doing just by the nature of spending more time under tension in that length and range it's quite nice to see some of those bro science tactics kind of coming out in in the new methodology now and kind of going hey they were kind of onto the right thing there without understanding all of the literature and science behind mm. it um so there's some considerations, well, some limitations, sorry, obviously, that we've kind of mentioned. So with that larger degree of stimulus comes a larger degree of fatigue. So potentially training volume needs to, may need to be adjusted um, so that the large degree of cost of stimulus will take away from that bank of energy and recovery that we have in the CNS. And then eventually you obviously have to pay that back on that loan. So potentially by including a high degree of fatiguing work, there may be considerations for changing volume per muscle group. Of course, like we mentioned, there's more skill required to train in that position. And obviously, like we mentioned, the length and range is the most vulnerable to injury on you know, all connective tissues as well as muscle tissue itself. So the programming considerations that we've kind of highlighted are quite good. But the length and loading in a, in a summary there is much, much more better for hypertrophic outcomes, but potentially is not strength related. Now, there's a, com a controversial study that just come out very, very uh, last night, literally very, very uh, Recently. soon. Yep. recently that's what i was looking for apologies <laughs> um so last night there was a study from Mena helmsman where he looked at the length and range loading and short and range loading of a bicep curl now in the first study i mentioned they actually highlighted as a conclusion they saw no change to strength adaptation on, or the perceived one rep max performance but in the study done on the bicep curl they found changes not only in hypertrophic adaptation training at longer muscle lengths but a larger degree of strength adaptation for the individual's perspective one rep max percentage um, so this is kind of controversial. I think most of the length and range loading studies that I've looked at has always been on kind of lower body dominant uh, you know, focus. So to see a, an upper body focus kind of contradict the strength change there um, was quite interesting, especially when we know that the hamstring and the bicep are somewhat very similar being pull levers in comparison to push levers. So I would have expected those outcomes to be very consistent. I know hmm. limited data and quantity in the studies does mean that it's not foolproof and that there are further questions to be asked. Um, but I'd, I'd be interested to see if, uh, again, not really relevant to people chasing bodybuilding outcomes. You know, we want to gain muscle. We're not weightlifters and we're not trying to chase performance necessarily or with that you know priority focus. But I think it'd be interesting to, to see if that does conclude a changing strength for performance. Because although, like I said, it's not the pinnacle of what we do as bodybuilders, it does have a factor into our ability to perform over time and to get stronger at muscle uh, at movements that, of course, will lead to better chances of making adaptations in skeletal tissue. Um, I think something that 
is important to highlight is that although we can see that length and range loading is slightly more beneficial going off of the data at the moment for skeletal tissue outcomes, that perhaps we shouldn't neglect training full range of motion because of this. We shouldn't then now just completely restructure all of our chain uh, training into length and range loading only because in theory, let's just all go do length and range partial reps and we may achieve optimal outcome. But there are still adaptations and stimulus being driven in the medial and the short on range. And that stimulus shouldn't go unmissed. Mm. Yeah, I'm glad you said that because I was going to say before, if anything, like this doesn't necessarily mean that individuals need to bias <clears throat> solely the length and range, but rather it may encourage those individuals out there that like to do short range, uh, a range of motion that are actually biasing the shorter range of the muscle typically when they do this, like, you know, most people who don't do a bench press to the maximum capacity of, you know, stretching the pecs or, you know, whatever, or a squat, you know, where they're like getting to it, not even to a curtsy, you know, then they're definitely not squatting, but they might be curtsying. Like it's just encouraging them to get themselves through full range. And by, by default of achieving full range, they're going to also achieve a greater bias towards the length and range that they otherwise would be missing out on. Mm. I do think it's difficult, particularly for a lot of guys who, feel like their ego is on the line when they lift weights in front of other people at the gym. And when we do, you know, sh shorter reps, we only go halfway down on a squat. If that we don't fully extend the elbow on curls, because we can lift more when we do it. And ego is sometimes attached to strength. It can be difficult for people to take a step back, take some weight off the bar in order to move forward later. Um, so oh, I, I do kind of feel for people that are, uh, don't quite have the the security. Is that the word I'm looking for? Like the mm. personal security to feel like they can change things up. I know um, my old training partner was definitely one of them. He didn't train legs as often as he should. And usually when we trained, because he's a dude, he I we, he basically would do double what I would do. And like, I'm fine with it. But on legs, he would match me um, and still would do partial reps because if he did a full rep, he would have to do less than me, which really hurt his ego. And that's not to say, oh, I'm so strong. That was to say he was like severely undertrained in his lower body. Um, so much so he only trained with Liz once and then he bailed. He vomited and then never <laughs> trained legs with me again. again. <laughs> only, only upper body was Liz. Yeah. See, um, I, was, I was that guy. Oh, yeah. no, I, I, talk, I can talk anecdotally when I first got into training I was that guy who was so heavy fixated on being the big like I wanted to be the biggest guy in the gym but I thought the route to achieving that was to lift the most amount of weight and be the strongest Even so I was that did it poorly. I used to lift with absolutely atrocious form and I can say now that the weights that I kind of touched with poor form was of course way higher than what I've done even now uh -huh. but by stripping back and taking that knock on my ego and really like looking in on myself going come on now what are you doing you're not growing at all you still look the same as you did 12 months ago even mm. though you're now quantifiably a lot stronger yeah in, in the partials yeah. you've not seen any change so something needs to change the minute I stripped my weight back and started applying correct form and application and actually allowing for some stretch mediated response and actually getting into that fully lengthened position I started growing it was like yeah. I just this big epiphany. You know, it was like magic to me. Yeah. But you, for anyone listening, you really do need to just put the ego aside, take the knock, see the improvements in your physique, and then let your ego develop later when you're massive. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> well, Absolutely. This, is, this is the thing. I think this is about the perception of like what you're trying to achieve. There's there's two issues with people that short range partial reps, right? One is that you need to instead of thinking about as a regression in your ego and your load. Think of about think about uh, if I do this, I grow more. If the goal is to grow more, then you can probably like re sort of structure your thoughts around the negative of reducing the weight. And the other one I think that people fall into problems with is the concept of progressive overload doesn't necessarily mean absolutely more load all the time, but rather a comparative shift and improvement in load from week to week on average over time. So like uh, for example, with similar if, technique. Yeah, yeah, like if you squatted 200 kilos, but you only did 50% of the rep, and then you drop that to 170 kilos, but you did 100% of the rep, although 170 is less than 200, and people perceive that to be a regression, next week when you do the same range at 171 and a half kilos, that is now progression contextually to the week prior. So yeah. like whatever your absolute numbers are, they don't mean fuck all in progression. You know, the uh, way I think of it is when you look at CrossFitters and they go through their workout, they have, they're called spotters, aren't they? People mm. who sit there and say like, no rep, mm. like that technique was poor, that rep doesn't count. 
that's how I think of people that have really poor technique that might only do half the rep because they can lift more weight. I'm like, you're not strong. That doesn't count. You did zero. Like that rep is like, that's a, that's a no rep. Yeah. I have to, I have to give a, a shout out to Jackson Pios momentarily. Why? He did a fucking reel the other week and he actually posted the dude too. Uh, it's a guy that the Australian bodies will know. He posted his leg press. I remember this one. He was in EMF in pack fan and he's like rep counter. And it was like 20 reps. Right. But he was just like, Jackson's just watching the video kind of going, okay, okay, okay. And the rep counter is just going zero, 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 <laughs> zero. He's like, so I, I can't remember what he said. But it was like some sort of truth. So I can't really give feedback on this because there was zero reps achieved. <laughs> but that's how I feel about people <laughs> who do partial reps when they're not doing partial rep training. Like you might be going from 200 kilos to 100 kilos, but in my mind, you've gone from zero kilos to 100 kilos. Yeah. Like it's a huge improvement. Yes, yeah, big time. I think it, the change in strength that I noticed, and this kind of contradicts obviously what I said about the, the the study earlier, about how they didn't see perhaps changes in one rep max strength. Something I've seen in myself from again drawing back slightly, but taking the win on to seeing more skeletal tissue adaptation by training with correct form, my strength shot massively up. It is quite in, uh, quite incredible seeing the numbers I started at post show coming back up obviously there's a lot of other variables changing of course oh. but the application to training was one something that really big changed with me with length and range loading something me and my coach worked on within my own programming and the strength that i've now i now see in those movements that i'm doing with correct form and a slightly more length and range bias my performance is increasing faster than it ever has yeah that's awesome i think also like you need to take a knock on the ego too if you have an uh you know a muscle group that is behind on others and then you assess your training uh, execution and you're like, oh, so I rush bicep curls, but I control my squats. Yeah. Like, stop rushing your fucking bicep curls, you know, like, um, and, and especially like there are certain muscles that just don't fare well to consistently adding more load. Um, so then you need to ask yourself, like, how other, how other, what are the other ways in which that I can create a greater stimulus here? And like you said, biasing the length and range length and range length and range that's a good one <laughs> length and range um, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to just sit there and just only do partials and it could be that you just spend more time there with a technique correction so that you have a better uh, understanding of how to use that particular well language. george talk us through that if somebody wanted to adopt length and training you tempo dean just kind of mentioned mm. there can you talk us through what that might actually look like assume so Let's look at the seated ham curl, just we've spoken about it quite a lot. Mm -hmm. The tempo we would use, okay, let's try and think how I explain this to most clients now when I talk about tempo. So the negative part of the rep, which will be you coming from your knees and feet tucked right up into the machine to your leg being fully extended again, that negative part contains a certain element of what's called stretch mediated hypertrophy. And this is kind of a concept theory at the moment, but it's because we can't quite lock in on the exact mechanism that's driving the response. There's theories around it with changes in sarcomeres uh, alignment and them being applied and attached in series as opposed to in parallel and things like this changing. Um, but essentially the tempo here, if we wanted to bias the length and range, we would apply a nice, slow, eccentric as you cross through from the shortened to the medium into the lengthened and perhaps look at a slight pause in that length and range that would increase the mechanical tension on that last sort of third of the rep, which is where the length and range stimulus is happening. Slowing that movement down into that and just taking it a lot slower creates more time spent under that tension in that stimulus. So that, that, that would be how you would manipulate that. Mm. And obviously, if you spend some time paused in the stretch, then again, it's it's increasing the time you're under that tension there. So the tempo might look like three, two, one, one, which would prefer to three second negative part or eccentric part of the movement, a two second pause in the stretch, a one second concentric or a positive part of the movement. And then the one second just kind of change in direction at the peak of contraction, as opposed to a big focus on squeezing that pump out. Mm. Yeah. So then you're like the, the bias is spent spending the most amount of time in the lengthening, the least yes. amount of time in the shortening, because there doesn't seem to be as much of an indicator of a, a higher hypertrophic stimulus when you are shortening that, that muscle. And if you did spend way too long focusing on that pump at the top, it could potentially take away from energy and fatigue. Uh, so provide more fatigue in the set, which means towards the end there, you're going to have less ability to apply that length and range loading where it's most important because you wasted oh. energy on a part of the rep that may be not so as important. 
Mm. An easy way I like to explain like the negative um, portion of the movement for people that just get a bit confused between concentric and eccentric and positive and negative is with gravity. So um, when the, the weight is moving with gravity, that's the portion that you want to slow down. So for a bicep curl, it's when your wrist or your hand is going towards the ground. For a uh, chest press, it would be when the bar is coming towards your chest. Um, I just think, yeah, for people that aren't very familiar with anatomy, that's an easy way to remember. Yeah. If it's hey? a lap pull down, it's the opposite. Yeah, yeah, when your arm's going up towards the sky. Exactly. Yeah. With gravity yeah. and yeah, against gravity. Um, what would you say then to somebody who wants to bastardize the concept and be like, well, then shouldn't we just do the slowest negatives possible? What, like a 10 second yeah. with gravity? Why not, why not do why not yeah. do in the hamstring curl a There's... seven second eccentric? The cost of fatigue, uh, I'd say that the cost of fatigue there, sp spending that long a time focusing on your, your eccentrics is going to change the ability to actually accumulate effective reps and take you efficiently close to proximity to failure. I feel like you're not going to get enough real activation stimulus from just spending so long. Like that 10 second eccentric, like what part of that is important? It's not the first five seconds as you're going through the eccentric. It's actually the last five seconds on the last half into the length and range. So that first five seconds, again, kind of ties back into maybe we're spending a bit too long here that's wasting and conserving energy that's taken away from reps at the end of the set when we're closer to our effective reps that are actually important for the adaptation. Mm. Because the first 50% of any rep, technically speaking here on the lengthening, is still biasing the short. Yes. The shorter side of that rep, whereas the last 50% is biasing that. Um, and then also, I think the the reason why you may not do that is because it's going to force you to decrease load so significantly that we then have to open up the discussion of what is tension and load is important for tension. And then what is the benefit of more load? And that is recruiting, you know, more muscle fibers immediately versus 10 reps from now. Um, so like, what would be your, I suppose, would there be a, um, like a maximum eccentric time frame that you would typically stick to? Or would it be exercise specific, I imagine? Uh, it would definitely, it would be exercise specific and client specific. Again, we have to factor in you know, what, what what they can achieve in their skill. I think anything past the four second eccentric and potentially you're running the risk there, of, like you said, taking away from your ability to apply good mechanical tension. Mm. And I think that's fair. Mm. A really four? tall person, maybe, maybe five. This, By default, like, yeah. Uh, another thing for people to kind of grasp on, on this is actually counting your seconds like uh, some one person's three seconds and another person three seconds seems to be completely different and it's a unit of measure so it should be consistent across the board and if people mm. are really concerned about this get the stopwatch up on your iphone or on your phone or whatever you've got and actually look at it whilst you're doing a rep and you'll understand how long three seconds actually is one mississippi two people... mississippi three mississippi not one two three yeah what I find when people try and count the seconds during a rep is um, they oh, like they stagger it or jerk it. So let's just try and imagine a bicep curl for those just listening. We go fully flexed elbow or kind of like hand to shoulder. And as they straighten out their arm, they like hold it at the top for one. Oh, yeah. And then they go halfway two when they hold it there and then like three at the bottom. It's like, no, this is supposed to be like a smooth transition. And I say it all the time when people try and do um, tempo training with like chin-ups, for example, they hold right at the top and they go halfway down for one, two, three, and then they drop. It's like, we're not, we're, that's not what we're trying to do here. Yeah. I like, <clears throat> I like the concept of eccentric under control is sort of yes. the, the, the average tempo, unless we're trying to, you know, drive a particular outcome. One of my clients, George, uh, actually has a metronome. In Name and change. Years. No, oh. this is good. He has a metronome in his okay. ears, three seconds, because he always rushes them. That's cute. Um, but then because he's got the metronome, he's like, I can't count reps. So, he's, <laughs> so his, his lovely partner counts his reps. And then he just listens to the metronome. I'm like, this is a fucking team effort. That's team effort. Um, the thing that I think people fuck up on this a lot, is similar to the jerk, though, is that apparently that universal time of three seconds changes when it hurts. <laughs> because it's... What, rep... Mississippi 2, Mississippi 3, Mississippi <laughs> No, yeah, it's rep 1 to 5 is 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000. Rep 6, 7, and 8 is 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000. <laughs> like, all of us, I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> Standardization. <laughs> Yeah, that was very quick and aggressive there, Lizzie, to jump on the name and shame. That's why I was laughing. 
I just think it's funny when people like kind of vaguely talk about someone. I was like, just say who it is. What's, what's the rhyming equivalent of a name and shame when it's a positive name and what? Uh, glorify. I don't know. No, but it's got name and fame. Really name, name and, and fame. fame. There it is, Jared Hall. You just got name and fame for being a metronome. <laughs> it was Jared. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah, I, metronome king. I like to. For me, when I'm training, I, I always find a an inability to keep a track on my reps when I'm really focusing on making sure I lock in on the tempo. So when it's a new movement for me, I will obviously put most of my application into the form of the exercise and make sure I get the movement correct with the right tempo. But I, there will be a case where I get to in the set and I'm like, fuck, was that 10 reps? Was that 12 reps? I think I lost count there. Shit. Once I've kind of got the first three locked in, I find that I can I can keep that consistent without needing to then count in my head the whole way through. But that's that's again thinking about training skill again with individuals. It's something you develop over time. The, to be able to mimic it without then counting is something you will learn the more you yeah. do. Just an idea for those who don't have a girlfriend to count for them, or like <laughs> you know, you could go with like just count your tempo if that's what you're doing tempo training. And just go to reps or failure. So you're like, you know, I, I think that I could probably only squeeze out one more before my leg snaps off or my technique falls to shit. Record your set and then watch it back and count your reps from the recording. Mm. I did that yesterday for my laying, laying squat. Did you? Uh, but in saying that, I'm exactly the same, George, and I find that is the setup. My, my mindset is this. I count the first three and set the appropriate tempo. And then every rep thereafter, I say, to them, don't you fucking change the, te- like the tempo. And then I just count the rep. I'm like, don't you dare change that tempo. And I'm like, oh, like, you know, because I'm reminding myself, hey, this is going to hurt soon. And when it starts to hurt, you're going to get faster because everybody fucking tries to get faster. Yeah. So then it's more of like, you know, self-hate for the last four to five reps. Um, <laughs> I think it's the perception of it, though. You call it self-hate, but like turn that into self-love, that feeling of pain. That is what we're looking for. That's what we want. That's where the change is happening. So put a positive spin on it. That pain when you're you're really trying to well, you're you're more likely to increase your rep speed because it's hurting. Slow it down and keep on top of it and turn that negative feeling and that pain into a positive spin that, yeah, this is where I'm making progress now. I it's, love it's myself same... enough to be honest. Yes. Mm. <laughs> That's a very good line. Hard to say that while you're under. Oh man, I think everyone who puts themselves through intense training has a lot of talk in their head. Mm. And I love myself enough to be honest with my tempo. Probably isn't going to enter the conversation, but you know, maybe it should. Just an idea. Far more competitive. Like Um, even when I was younger, you piece of shit. (laughs) No, when I was younger and I played football, I and I wanted to run like a certain distance for fitness. Mm -hmm. I want to do a two k time trial. Yeah, I would always make sure that like the last. 500 600 meters required me to run past my house so that i had the opportunity to quit okay but i never fucking would because every time i do it i'd be like if you fucking stop now somebody else wouldn't have yeah so then i'd force myself to do the the last block to make it i don't know why but this is the shit that you do sometimes i think it's a good exercise in like mental toughness well that was essentially why i did it It was like you 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 were you know no one's watching you're running by yourself on the road you have some integrity you piece of shit yeah and that's kind of like my mindset when i do rep when i know reps are gonna (laughs) suck i'm like fuck like here we go you know i I think i know what lizzie's internal voice is when she's training now (laughs) honestly for a long time my fuel was like the anger of life now it's more like it's not that anymore but yeah it's hard to hurt yourself to the point of progress when when you're not angry i think well for me because that was my fuel for so long i had to find a new fuel source yeah see, see most people look at me a bit strange when i'm in the gym because I, I could have mariah carey playing in my ears and be <laughs> because i i need to be zen like all of that hyping yourself up pre to set like high stim pre's and shouting and slapping yourself i will underperform if i did all that like right. shouting now, I've never understood like when people are shouting they get ah, 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 before a set yeah. you're losing oxygen you're not replenishing oxygen and it's taking away like surely if you just it's kept exhausting yeah. I hate the it- slap I'm like if you fucking slap me I will get off this and punch you <laughs> <laughs> don't you fucking dare <laughs> like- literally <laughs> so you know like Halloween is an excuse to like dress like a bit of a hoe and not be judged I think the gym is an excuse to like physically abuse people and not yeah, be like, I'm helping I'm helping you don't you want to squat mm. yeah <laughs> starts off as a nice pat on the back but you realize your missus left you last night so it becomes a punch <laughs> <laughs> and then suddenly they're like screaming I'm like oh that was a great set everyone made I'm like 
the cadence of your rep is the same for every rep. You just make a lot of noise. Like yeah. it wasn't even close to failure, motherfucker. <laughs> That's so funny. Mm. Okay. So, George, thank you for the information. I feel like that. I hope that was useful for a lot of people and also put into context when we might want to use it, a growth phase, when we might not, a maintenance or weight loss phase. Um, maybe beginners might not want to, maybe advanced people, intermediate and above might want to. Hmm. Are there any other really important points that you think we might not have touched on when it comes to length and reps? Off the top of my head, I don't think there's any kind of good foundations that we haven't covered really. Okay. It's not as a, as a in-depth specific topic as, as most people might overcomplicate or think. Yeah, so I think uh, it is probably important to note that in most of this research that you uh, referenced us to, that volume was equated. So like they did the same amount of work. Mm -hmm. It's yes. just that they were biasing lengthened exercises versus shortened and they found greater hypertrophy in the lengthened. So it, this doesn't negate the fact that you still need to be progressing and doing more work over time. Uh, it's just that it is encouraging individuals to say, hey, don't shorten the rep where you're missing out on potential, you know, at the end of that rep to, mm -hmm. to get more growth. Um, but also don't then just only bias length and work. Yeah. Be okay with dropping the weight if you need to in order to do it better. Mm, yeah. Quality like of reducing quantity. the weight, not dropping the weight. Because if you drop the weight, you don't lift it, you won't grow You up. might break your foot if you drop the weight. Yeah. Reduce the weight. One of my weight. clients had a fucking friend of his mm -hmm. drop a fucking weight on his toe and split him open. Oh, my ex got his foot broken because he got angry at someone in the gym and like slammed a weight plate down and broke his own foot. That's awesome. I know. <laughs> That's why I feel like I don't need revenge on him. It's just like him living his life is revenge because he's such a big <laughs> so I was literally waiting for that comment from one of you. <laughs> 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 um yeah cool i like it um it's kind of, it seems kind of intuitive mm. like as in that in the intuitive in that taking a muscle through its fullest like full range is likely going to be beneficial mm. um well tempo training was all the craze what like 10 years ago but they didn't really uh focus on the length and portion it was more like having a sensible tempo is important but we didn't have all the nuances that we have now but then there was also like a misdirection though, and there was greater tempo placed even into the shortening and concentric rate, which mm. I would absolutely say is a waste of fucking time. Unless you're talking about injury management or something. Five seconds squeezes at the top of your rep and things like this that used to be the craze. Right. So, oh. Yeah. Nothing's happening like there. I, I love I just, the, the shift. Like there's like time under tension, mm -hmm. which has some sense in to it. And mm -hmm. then there was uh, Dennis James, who's a bodybuilder. He created MTUT, which is maximum time under tension. Oh, and it's got to be better than time under tension. He would do like five second second legs. Legs. So what? Then, I've I've seen people doing ten to fifteen second legs before. Uh, yeah. Negative, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So oh. I, really, uh, I I see some application outside of bodybuilding with things like that within like rock climbing, you know, oh, yeah. Climbing. Things like that, really good application for other sports, but in bodybuilding, that you know, these are the individuals aren't trying to gain muscle, but we are. Mm. Yeah, but this was like five second eccentric, one to two second pause, five second concentric, one to two oh, second yeah. pause. So it's like getting a dude who can lift a tremendous amount of weight, fucking spending so much time trying to shorten a muscle that wants to be able to like use some power and contraction. Yeah. Now, again, I'll, I'll asterisk this like I have in a lot of things and say that there are potentially some reasons why someone might do this if they have injury concerns or issues where they can't load it properly, but they're the people that are sitting on the outside of the bell curve. Um, so like there is application for it, but it shouldn't be the primary application or the, or the um, what's the word I want this time? Let's put it into my penis. No, uh, I was going to say put it into my mouth. I'm glad I stopped. <laughs> that could have gone like... <laughs> That could have been perfect, but I just, I caught you. I knew it was going to happen. Um, <laughs> yes, yeah, you ask me the question, assume it's coming out the gutter. <laughs> no, I only help George. I'm sorry. Yeah, Team George. All right. Um, what is the word you're looking for, Dean? I will help you. I don't even remember what I was saying anymore. I just got so worried about having penis in my mouth <laughs> okay. that, that I ran. Sure. Don't know if you won't like it unless you've tried it. And don't knock it till you try it, dude. And I mean, a penis is better when it's in the length and range too. That's <laughs> no, one likes, no one likes a short penis. <laughs> I love it. I love it. That's so funny. I don't know where to go from here. 
Uh, maybe. Well, okay, no, let's yeah. just, just finish up one more thing. Okay, okay. Uh-huh. If, let's even think about this, right? <laughs> if you were trying to strengthen the erection okay. with the towel by hanging it over the erection, yes. which do you think would generate the greatest amount of like support? Would it be training it when it's like at half mast and maintaining that okay. on stretch? mid rep, Or would it be when it's at the peak, like peak at the top? Are we training a penis now? Is yeah, we are. But what, oh, okay. I was, what I was going to say is if you put but your you towel on it when it's at full erection, it's going to have less tension. That's true. Because the, the lever arm is actually going to be shorter compared to where it is on the fulcrum. Yes. So even in a penis, if you want the penis erection to be stronger, you should probably train it when it's... Uh, have you ever put penis wraps erection. into someone's program? No. Okay. No, but you definitely, as, as a male, we have all definitely done the little... The little wiggle thing that you do when you sit there. tested a towel out. How heavy of a towel can I hold? Putting, putting something like a towel on it and going, yeah, I can move it like a bicycle. <laughs> Come on. I'm a fucking jacket. <laughs> Look, if I had a penis for a day, I think that's all I would do for 24 hours. And, oh, it's, I would definitely helicopter. Would you wear it as a watch? Yeah. I'd do all sorts of things. <laughs> I'd watch puppetry of the penis and just try and copy it all. Oh. Okay, I wonder, with stretch media in response and like, uh, the connective tissue. I wonder if there would be a way to elongate the penis with some like loaded stretching. I think you'd have to ask Lee Priest. Oh, he wow. would, know. would he? Why would well, Lee he's, Priest? He's openly talked about the fact that he's like penis pumped his penis into something that was twice the size, but it was essentially just engorged with blood and useless. And Jesus Christ. He's an interesting man. Are there videos? Uh, I'm not <laughs> sure. He's also got it on with the dude. Does he? I mean, All right. Yeah. He, Lee doesn't course. give a fuck. Good for Lee. I'm happy yeah, to leave. Yeah, it's 2023. Um, you, you. Well, no. he was doing him in 20, in 20, 2020 and 2000. Eh? I'm saying it's not even 20. Lee didn't need to 2023 in order to do him. Right. Yes. Good old Lee. The OG. Um, George, if we wrapped this up with take home point, how might people be less shit when it comes to the topic of today? At the bare minimum make sure you're training to a full range of motion that's comfortable within what you can do in your mobility. Mm-hmm. That is like the foolproof bullet pro safety net there without talking about specifically bias in any sort of movement. If you just train at full range of motion, you'll be getting a good degree of stimulus in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I like your asterisks of like what you're capable with mm. your mobility. That's yeah, important. Good. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I don't want anyone thinking this just because they can't get their scapulas back when they're doing a chest press that they're doing it wrong. It's what yeah. you can do with. Mm. I like it. I like it too. Um, all right. So something worth sharing, George. It can be on topic, training and nutrition, or not, a book, a holiday destination, a recipe. Do you have something worth sharing with the audience? The app that I use to track and log my workouts is called Heavy Set. And within that, they have a metronome built in so that as you're doing your set, say you've got your AirPods in or headphones or whatever it is you're using, you can listen to the metronome of doing its beats. So to and count your seconds as you go with that, as opposed to trying to focus on counting yourself. So it might allow you to better track your reps that you're doing in your sets and still be able to focus on that tempo and form because that little metronome in the background will keep you on point with the timings. I like it. Heavy set is good. And I, I don't know what it is now, but I think it was like $15 Australian for a lifetime access uh, so that you can customize some training programs and stuff. So hopefully it's still the same. Just appreciate it. Uh, see, because because my uh, my training block is always progressing, like from week to week, there's always another set or something added in. I've never really bothered to purchase it. I just go improvise workout every time, and just as I'm going, I'll write it in rather than customizing the workouts. I find it, if, if the free version is very very good. Well, you may have been charged without knowing, because when I first got it, you only had the opportunity to do three workouts, and then they forced you to pay if you wanted to do more, if you wanted to like relog oh. more. So you may have actually paid for it, mate, and you didn't even know. May, yeah, maybe that makes more sense. I'm going to have to go back through and double check that now. <laughs> I've been saying the whole time going oh, to all my clients, yeah, it's free. Look, you can just log your workouts. You don't have to like detail the whole plan out. You can just go improvise workout, just type it in manually. And maybe well, maybe, <laughs> maybe, you, maybe you found a, a loophole. Who knows? Yeah, actually, let us know because I know Dean wanted to use it. I do use it. It's oh. great. Oh, you paid for it. I was it. like, for 15 bucks, I'm, I'm using it. Yeah, what, $15 what, yeah. a month? No, a lifetime. Like, that was the thing. It was literally a once-off purchase. Take my money. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. He may have been charged and not even known through the old Apple ID. Well, who cares? <laughs> for like £10, pounds, $15, he gives you yeah. shit. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. all good. Uh, some, uh, would you rather? Ooh. You got one or do I have one? Oh, no, I never had one of them. No, okay. George. George A. Would Gorgeous you George. Gorgeous George. 
which is the name he put in when he booked up time for this podcast, isn't it? Gorgeous mean. George. It's because um, I have a beard and you can't see my double chins currently. <laughs> <laughs> that is the perfect disguise. Mm-hmm. Can I grow a beard? And then get so Any, heavy, I get a double enough, chin. Enough test. Uh, look, I've got the formula. Test and GH. That's how mine grew. All right, look, I'm in England March Same. 1. I'll, oh, no, March 15. I'll, I'll get the enough test to grow a beard off you then. It might be, might be much. You might get you might get what you asked for earlier, Dean, with a dick in the mouth. <laughs> <laughs> be careful what you wish for. Yeah. George, would you rather spend one year in bright sunlight 24 hours a day or almost complete darkness for 24 hours a day? Fuck. I would assume there would be more consequences to spending longer in total darkness than there would be to UV exposure and sunlight. So I'm going to opt what, for like total vitamin daylight. Vitamin D deficiency and... I think even you said like rhythm. I, I know like even the countries that live up close to like uh, the Arctic or Antarctic around that area, they have perceived sunlight for months at a time and, and darkness for months at a time. And I'm sure there's a lot of different nutrient deficiencies that come from that, not just outside of vitamin D. I, I've, I've seen this. I think I've seen this on a David Attenborough thing before, actually. I'm, oh. I'm trying to recommend it. I'll have to, I'll have to send it to you if I find it. I will definitely opt for sunlight because I can cover my eyes with, you know, sleep mask or whatever to get to sleep or black out the blinds. Definitely. That's true. Also, I think there's no current disorder recognised for too much sunlight, but there is in the darkness. Mm. And it's called sad. <laughs> it is. <laughs> seasonal <clears throat> something depression. Disorder. Oh, yeah. Every, yeah. every effectiveness. Window, it's seasonal is. effectiveness, I think it is. Seasonal effectiveness disorder. Disorder, yeah. Uh, for those every that uh, have yeah reduced sunlight periods. Um, oh, the winter that we spent in England, was it like, 2022's winter mm-hmm. fuck i was so down for no reason and like the only thing i can put it down to was that there was just absolutely no sunlight because there was sunlight between what like i think 9 a.m and 3 mm. and i was working in those hours and yeah. um oh, so i feel for people who well firstly george you have to survive an english winter every year what the fuck I was- when Dean said about the sad thing, I was like, yeah, no, I get that every single year. It gets to about like just past my birthday in September. And then I start to get a little bit weird and moody and a bit like sluggish. And like, I don't want to mm. do anything. Just I just feel down for no apparent reason. But yeah. again, it's like I said, it is, the, the daylight hours are like nine to three and it's like, it's fucking bizarre. But I'll get up and do my steps in the morning early. They're ticked off and I'm at the laptop in them hours. And I'll go to the gym probably from three o'clock onwards. So yeah. I'm out in the dark at any time. The only light I get is in this room. That was exactly us. We did morning steps in the dark. We, you know, went for afternoon adventures and nighttime and training in the dark. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is exactly why you take the sunlight option. Yeah. Yeah. I've looked at getting a sad lamp. They literally have created a a lamp with like artificial UV exposure. So it can kind of negate against this. Uh, There's Mm -hmm. a couple of people at the Zeke Collective that have got them that said they're really, really good. Oh, cool. Mm -hmm. So what, they just put it on in their house? Yeah, it looks like a mini ring light. It's just really fucking bright. Like it is very... (laughs) <laughs> maybe uh, i'll have to let you know uh, for quick data if i load up the melanotan it will we'll see a good response <laughs> easy money that's funny no that's that's really wise if i lived in a country um where every winter was like that i think it's such a great investment in your health mm. that why wouldn't you yeah i think yeah, there's a, a decent is it a, a, it might be on freakonomics mm-hmm. or i think it might be the ask stupid questions mm-hmm. spin off of freakonomics no stupid questions no stupid questions that's it mm-hmm. um that are they specifically tap into sad some of the light some of the research and all that stuff on there too right so you okay. can look that up if anyone's interested well look it up you don't even know what podcast it was. Uh, I think was it, it freakonomics um, or no st- i think it may have been no stupid questions Dean, uh, only because i remember the girl and i forget her name angela duckworth yeah duckworth speaking of her colleague who uses the sad light okay um, and other i task you dean with the project of looking for the exact podcast show notes. give it to me and i will make sure it goes in the show notes Sunday. yeah georgie if people wanted to follow you how might they find you uh, on Instagram, I am flexcoach underscore George. You can hit me up there. Follow me. For, follow, follow through my link tree to any of my application processes. Uh, obviously, that will take you through to the Flex Success website. Um, so Instagram is where you'll find me. Uh, and of course, my DMs are always open for any questions or considerations. Just fire away. Drop me a message. Love it. Easy, Perfect. Thank you, George. Thank you, listeners. And we'll see you in the next episode. <laughs>